Hi, Jeff. Hey, Frank. Thanks for having me again. Good to see uh, you. Oh man, it's it's been it's been a very very long time. I mean, very very long time. Uh, I think the last time I saw you was, um, I mean, my memory. You know, I'm not that old, but still, um, it was um, in 2010, I think, because I that's the last time I visited Palestine. Um, I was denied entry in 2013, and I haven't been back since. So. Um, it's great, honestly, to have you uh, to have you on, and it's great to be able to have a, like this uh, conversation with you. Uh, to give it a bit of context, I, I first met you in two thousand and seven, uh, in my you know my first visit to Palestine, a visit that actually changed everything in my life. You know, yeah, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. I keep yeah. repeating this, but this was really like what two thousand and seven in in Palestine was for me. And I was part of a tour with uh, a very good friend, L Linda, and um, and you know ICAD, so the right. Israeli Committee Against House Demolition that you founded. Mm -hmm. And and at the time, I remember you um, using this expression many times, like you know you you called Israel um, Israel's matrix of control over the Palestinian population, um, mm -hmm. focusing you know primarily uh, in the West Bank because that's that's where any East Jerusalem, because that's where you you live, and um, and I wanted to ask you about this. You know, we're going to talk about Gaza, and obviously the focus is on Gaza right now. But um, Israel Israel's repression in the West Bank has also accrued uh, accrued heavily in the last few months. And I was wondering, in a way, I, I hope you can keep it short. What's <laughs> in a way? What's the main lessons you have learned from your thirty years now? Uh, experience in the West Bank? Well, um, you know, ICAD, the organization I run, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, is a political organization. So we resist, we rebuild homes. I go on speaking tours, I write books, we produce materials, educational materials, we work with other groups, but we're really political. And if you look at it politically, in fact, what's happening in the West Bank, even though it's being overshadowed by Gaza, is actually much more important than what's happening in Gaza. You know, Gaza is fairly marginal to Israel. The West Bank is where Israel is expanding into. And Zionism's whole purpose was to Judaize Palestine, to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country. And what we call Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, is much more important for Israel and Jerusalem than Gaza is. And so that's where we really have to look. And the idea of the matrix of control was this, that Israel wants to control and basically Judaize with its settlers. You know, there's 750,000 settlers today in the West Bank and really make it a part of Israel. But it can't annex it because... If, if it annexed it, what do you do with the Palestinians who are, you know, five million Palestinians in the occupied territory? And so you're in an apartheid situation and, and you can't formally be an apartheid. International community would have to demand equal rights for Palestinians. There wouldn't be a Jewish state. So Israel's solution is no solution. In other words, we, we build this matrix of control of settlements and highways and checkpoints and legal regulations on Palestinians and house demolitions and taking land and preventing farming and confining the Palestinians to these small 185 little islands in what we call areas A and B of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and, and of course, Gaza, which is a, a destroyed concentration camp. So the idea then is that de facto, this is all Israel. It's all Jewish. There's nothing to prevent Jewish settlement. It's all incorporated into Israel, but it's not official. It's like a permanent steady state. You know, we just keep the whole thing going. And then, of course, the two-state idea is used by Israel and governments uh, as a conflict management tool. So you're always promising the Palestinians, yes, there'll be negotiations. Yes, we want your national rights. Yes, there'll be a Palestinian state, but you never get there. There haven't been negotiations now for 10 years, since 2014. And so that's the whole idea of the matrix of control. 
and that is to basically fulfill the purpose of Zionism, which is to settle the entire land of Israel and Judaize it and create an apartheid regime, but to do it all under under the uh, um, you know under this uh, uh, threshold in which the international community has to react. It's not an official apartheid regime. Israel hasn't annexed. The Palestinians aren't officially uh, in a Bantu stand. And, and so the whole thing is then going like this forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's the way, is, and, and Israel continues to Judaize, and that's basically how it wins. And another thing I remember you, uh, you telling us, because we were a, a little group, is that uh, the apartheid wall, the separation wall, was a, was a way for, for the Israelis not to see the Palestinians. Um, and in a way, to continue living a normal life, while on the other side of the wall, people struggled to survive, to eat, to feed their children, etc. Um, so in a way, like erasing the Palestinians out of Israelis' consciousness has been a key part of the Zionist project, right? Exactly. I mean, you have to erase them because uh, in a civil colonial situation like Zionism is, um, you have to deny not only the national rights of a people that, uh, that are challenging your exclusive claim to their country, as Zionism did, as the Jews do, uh, but you have to deny their very existence. And so basically, you know, there are no Palestinians. There's a bunch of Arabs, you know, a, a collection of Arabs. We don't use the word Palestinian, really. And, uh, and then, of course, they've been displaced and they've been confined. Though I mean, Half the Palestinians are refugees, many, four million of whom are outside Palestine completely for all these generations. Um, so you erase them. And you make them disappear behind walls, behind, you know, and you reduce them to a security problem. So what's interesting is, I mean, now we have Gaza. So, but what concerns Israel about Gaza is only the hostages, the Israeli hostages. It isn't Gaza, it's not the military, because they have complete confidence that the army is, is on top of it all and destroying Gaza. And that's fine. 94% of Israelis support the military campaign in Gaza which has been called genocidal by the world court. Um, that doesn't matter to them. Uh, and so uh, and so Israel has succeeded in insulating its population from the wider region, from the wider Arab world, certainly from Palestinians. And so they become abstract. They really don't exist. You don't see them. You don't hear them. There once in a while is a terrorist attack. So you're reaffirmed with the idea that, well, we can never live with them because they're simply terrorists. Uh, and uh, and that's how Israel really maintains a very normal everyday life. You know, people say to me, "Wow, you're Israel in the middle of this one of the biggest conflicts." You don't feel it here. You know, the sun is shining, the economy is doing okay. I mean, maybe now with a few bumps with Gaza, but the economy is doing fine. Israelis feel very secure, even though that was part of the trauma of October seventh was that Hamas broke through. But but basically, you know. You live a, a very normal European level life here in Israel, very quiet, uh, and uh, and the Arabs don't exist. The Arabs are over there somewhere. We don't see them, and uh, and we've erased them. And there's simply a security problem. So that is hard to convey to people. But in fact, uh, Israel, uh, you know, might as well be a neighboring state of Belgium, <laughs> because. There is no Middle Eastern context uh, to it, to it in a sense, uh, and that's and so uh, you know it's interesting how little the whole Palestinian issue really penetrates into you know there was a poll in the last election by the Haaretz newspaper what's on the minds of Israelis when they're going into the election, and what we're talking about Palestinian rights occupation was number eleven on the list of, I mean, almost at the bottom. So that's how much Israel succeeded really in insulating its population from what we would call this conflict. Is this why you think, as a lot of people maybe not really familiar with the situation in Palestine, 
uh, I've, I've asked me in the last few months, how come a people that has suffer, suffered a, a Holocaust, you know, the, you know, the genocide of genocides, is actually cheering for the genocide of Gaza? People have a very hard time understanding that. But you've sort of answered now, but can you maybe explain a bit more? Well, obviously, Israelis think this genocide charge is outrageous, absurd, uh, grotesque, and everything. They, they certainly don't accept that. You know, because, uh, again, there's a logic to settler colonialism, <laughs> and that is that you have to erase the past. You have to erase what's been done because, uh, you know, what's been done is violent. You know, Israel has violently displaced the Palestinians and taken over their country. So you can't go back. So what you have to always do is start at the latest event, you see. So everything starts now with October 7th. When Guterres, the UN Secretary General, said, you know, October 7th happened in a, in a context, the Israelis were furious, you see, because that opens up Pandora's box. Whoa, wait a minute. Occupation, uh, colonization, displacement, our violence towards Palestine. You don't want to get into that. So you keep that box closed. And so you start with October 7th. You saw that in the ICJ hearings. That's where the Israelis began their case, October 7th. So if it's October 7th, then we're the victims. They're the human animals. They're attacking us in the most barbaric way possible. They're the, uh, you know, they're the terrorists. They're the culprits. They brought on the suffering on the Palestinians that they're suffering. Now, you see, you're off the hook because, and of course, our Holocaust and being Jewish sets up this thing. We're, we're the ultimate victims, you see, and Israel holds on to that. It weaponizes anti-Semitism. It weaponizes the Holocaust uh, so that for Israelis, we can never be responsible. That's the point. We can never be responsible. We're always the victims. And therefore, basically, we can do anything we want to do because we have the power. You know, Israel is one of the most powerful military powers in the world, uh, but we have no responsibility, certainly towards Palestinians or Arabs that are simply, uh, you know, trying to eliminate us. They're trying to, you know, and we use the word Holocaust for, the, for Gaza. You know, what they did on October 7th was genocide towards us. So the whole thing gets turned around in the Israeli mind. Uh, something that you, you, you've, al you've already sort of spoke about a little bit here is, um, you know, one of the purpose of your work in the last 30 years has been to reframe the Palestine-Israel question for the eyes of people in Israel, but also outside and in, in the world. Why are you, for example, opposed to when people say the Israel-Palestine conflict? Right. Well, again, you see, there's a funny situation, you know. Settler colonialism has become a very common term now in our world. When we talk about it, everything is settler colonialism. It's always become a mantra. It's good that the term is out there, but it's not so good that it's simply become kind of a, a catchword. It's become kind of a, an accusation. We throw it out. We banter it around. But it really means something. Settler colonialism really means something. It means when a people come to a country with the intent of taking it over and either eliminating or erasing or driving out the local population and replacing it with their own. And like I said, replacing Palestine with Israel. That's, that's the logic and everything fits into that. Well, in the, settler colonialism is unilateral. There's no conflict here. A conflict is between two sides, right? You've got uh, two sides that come to that fight about something, come into conflict. Now, how do you resolve a conflict? Conflict resolution. You negotiate. You compromise. Well, this is a situation in which Zionism and Israel today invaded Palestine. With the intent of taking it over, there was no the, uh, Palestinians never had a fight with the Jews. They never had anything. They, there was never a, a, a conflict here. So you can't equate um, a settler colonial invasion in which the indigenous population resists 
their, the violent takeover of the country and their own erasure with a conflict that's somehow symmetrical between two sides. There aren't sides in a settler colonial conflict. There's only one side, and that's the colonizers coming in to invade and take over. And uh, the indigenous have to, and they can never stop resisting, you see? And that's why the word conflict is not a good term because, again, it leads to the idea, well, we have to negotiate. That's what Biden is talking about now. We have, now we have to really negotiate two-state solution. Well, what are Palestinians supposed to negotiate? You know, uh, their right to their homeland? Uh, you know, the, the right of refugees to come back? All right, we'll negotiate only half of our refugees will come back. Uh, you know, our right, our, our patrimony to this country, our right to 78% of the country that the colonists are, are claiming. What exactly are we expecting the Palestinians to compromise on? And that's the problem. This is an anti-colonial struggle. And uh, and that's the logic of the resistance. And, and that's the terminology we have to use rather than conflict that actually legitimizes Zionism. It legitimizes the colonial enterprise because it makes it a, a side. And now, now the victims, the indigenous, are expected somehow to negotiate their own rights with a, a superior, politically and militarily superior colonial power that really has no rights here. So the whole thing becomes very, very warped and, and, and self-defeating, certainly for the Palestinians. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I remember also, um, you know, it's funny because you mentioned the two-state solution and it makes me laugh, but we'll, we'll come back to this because, you know, the two-state solution was like the solution after Oslo for about 10, 15 years. And then even people in the Western world and stuff realized like, you know, this is bullshit. We can't talk about the two-state again. And, and now suddenly they're like, we have the solution. It's the two-state solution. Okay. It's crazy, but I want to come back to this. Before then, there's also a lot of people that still believe, you know, there's some really good Israelis in Israel. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you live in Israel. You know, uh, Ilan lives in Israel. Um, Nurit Peled lives in Israel. But anyway, there's this movement, you know, Jewish leftists, you know, we need to talk to them, Jewish Israelis leftists to, and they will be at the core of, you know, the freedom of the Palestinians. I remember you telling me, again, at least 10 years ago, because I, I don't know if you still have it, but at the time you had an ICAD office also in West Jerusalem. Yes. I think you told me, you know, a few years after, this office in West Jerusalem is useless. You know, no one, no Israelis really want to come and engage on the question and stuff. How, in a way, has Israeli society changed in recent years? And do you expect, like, a, a proper, you know, leftist movement to come out of maybe the genocide in Gaza? No, no, there is no left movement. First of all, we the left left, <laughs> the five or six people you mentioned, uh, you know, suffer the same thing the left suffers all over the world. And that is we're not organized, we have no political programs, we, you know, we become a social movement or a bunch of disconnected groups, single issue groups that protest and once in a while, we have a demonstration somewhere, it's completely ineffective. I have no, I, I, you know, that's another story <laughs> about how could we build a more effective left all over. And so the Israeli left here is, has really disappeared, basically. There's a few small groups that, that protest, uh, you know, in Sheikh Jarrah, or they, you know, they go down to the South Hebron Hills and they build, uh, you know, bathrooms for people. Or, I mean, it's, it's very good work. You know, Rabbi Eric Arshman goes and works with the shepherds, try to keep them on the land against the violent settlers. I mean, I'm not minimizing that, but it's not political, and it's not it's not effective. And that that's really the problem. So that so that basically, for the vast majority of Israelis, including the Zionist left, let's say the Labour Party and Merits and all the good liberals that are here that are really, uh, that are really Zionists, that want that you have to be a Jewish state. And so they're kind of locked into that whole uh, settler mode. Um, you know, uh, they can't go anywhere. They're trapped in, in, in because it, there has to be a Jewish state. 
And because now there are 750,000 settlers in the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem that we can't bring home, there's no will domestically or internationally to force all those people back. There is no Palestinian state. Uh, and, and we're in an apartheid situation. So what the Zionist, uh, the Zionist left just can't deal with it. So, for example, we've had before October 7th, a year of these tremendous protests against judicial reform that Netanyahu uh, tried to uh, tried to impose on the country, and everybody was out. The, the 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 pilots of the air force, the military officers, the every liberal person in the country was hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. They made a decision from the first day that we are not dealing with occupation. The whole slogan of this huge mass movement was democracy. Democratia, that was the, that was the chant. And the signs and democracy, save democracy. But we can't mention the word occupation. So the trouble is, it's a little bit like the whites in South Africa, in a sense. You know, where Israeli Jews are committed to this system uh, for security reasons and because they want a Jewish state that's now bigger than it was in 1967. Um, they're, they're stuck with a good part of the West Bank. They're stuck with the fact that they cannot offer the Palestinians any kind of meaningful self-determination. So they, so they just ignore it. They focus on issues like judicial reform, the economy, you know, liberal kinds of issues. And that's why I'm saying our office was irrelevant in West Jerusalem. You cannot work with the Israeli public. I think the ANC realized that in South Africa, that the whites in South Africa were not going to dismantle the apartheid regime because even if they didn't like it, the liberals didn't like it, maybe they, you know, they, first of all, they were committed to it. That's where their, li their livelihoods were, their incomes, their, their quality of life was, was that. And also, you know, their term was bloodbath. If it ends, there'll be a bloodbath if blacks take over, the black Africans and so on. They were, and Israeli Jews are locked into this in the same way. You know, this is where their, their standard of living is. This is the good Israel that we, liberal democracy, European country that we have is dependent on keeping the status quo. And they're also afraid of what happens if we give equal rights to Palestinians and refugees return and we become a minority here. So basically what I'm saying is in our struggle, we have to do what the ANC did, bypass the Israelis. A lot of Palestinians even say, well, one state could never happen because, or even a, a just two-state solution could never happen because the Israelis would never allow it. That's true. But why? We're we giving the Israelis now the, the power to determine for us what the parameters of a just resolution to a colonial situation is we shouldn't. And so what the ANC did is they bypassed the whites and the government and, and all governments, because the governments were also in bed with the apartheid regime. And they went to the people. They went to all of us. Everybody my age was engaged in the anti-apartheid struggle. Churches and, and trade unions and everybody. That's what the Palestinians have to do, in my view, with support of critical Israelis like me. We have to forget about the Israelis. We don't have to talk to them. We have to go abroad. We have to we have to mobilize the international. There's tremendous support for the Palestinians in the world. We see it now. And I think the Palestinian issue has achieved the level of the anti-apartheid struggle. The problem is, and we'll get into this in a second, the, pro the fatal flaw of the Palestinian struggle is there is no end game. And you can't be in a political struggle without an end game. When we were boycotting the South Africa apartheid regime, we knew why. The, the, what was the program of the ANC? One person, one vote. And Mandela says, I'm sitting in prison until, you know, de Klerk came with all kinds of ideas, power sharing, and, and, and he said, no, we have our end game, and that was it. Palestinians don't have that. Some are two-state. A few are one state, which is the group I'm trying to work with. People even talk about confederation. A lot of Palestinians say, we don't even care what the solution is. Just give us our human rights. That's what's known as the human rights approach, I think, is, is, is self-defeating. In other words, until the Palestinians 
And this, and I cut them all the slack in the world because, you know, they've set up the PA against them as a collaborationist regime. They've dispersed them all over the world. They're not in communication. I mean, the PLO has been dismantled, basically. There is no center. There's no leadership. So it's an uphill struggle for them. Nevertheless, it has to be led by Palestinians, the struggle. And there has to be, in the end, a critical mass of Palestinians that come behind some kind of an end game. And if they can do that, then they can mobilize this tremendous support abroad. In other words, all the groups all over the world that exist, uh, you know, Palestinian solidarity groups, doing BDS and lobbying and campaigning and the huge demonstrations, that's all great. But they have to, but but they can't advocate for anything. What do you want? You can't go to parliament and say to your government, this is how we want you to change your policy because there is no end game. There is no political program. And until we have that, we're locked into this reactive protest kind of a situation and Israel wins. So that I think is, uh, uh, you know, is is, uh, is the reality. And, and so I think we have to forget about Israelis, but we mm. certainly have to work with the only allies we have, which is all of you. <laughs> the the peoples of the world, yeah. you know, that have really shifted to the Palestinians, but they need direction, they need leadership, and they need a political program. Okay, so actually, let's let's end with this. I'm not going to ask you to write down a political program, but your your last book with Pluto Press, okay. called "Decolonizing Israel: Liberating Palestine," uh, you make the case for a one state solution. Uh, some people, and we know who I'm talking about, say such a solution is anti-Semitic because it would mean the end of the Jewish state. So how would you respond to this? And, and what's, in your opinion, what's a one-state solution? Well, the only solution, the only solution is, is one democratic state. I, I don't see anything else. There, Israel has already created one state. One state exists. There's one, and that's why Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and the UN and B'Tselem all talk about apartheid. You know, there is one apartheid regime between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River, from the river to the sea, and that's Israel. So, so Israel has eliminated the two-state solution, basically. There already is one legal regime, an apartheid regime. So our job then is clear, from my point of view at least, and that's to transform the one apartheid regime that Israel has created, which is a Jewish apartheid regime. You know, unlike, you know, there was a white apartheid regime, this is a Jewish apartheid regime, to dismantle that and transform it into one state that's not apartheid, one state that gives equal rights to everyone. Now, Equal rights can't be a bad thing. I mean, I don't know why it's so outrageous and anti-Semitic to say this whole country and everybody living here should be living as equal citizens in a democratic state. Why is that so, so terrible, you know, and anti and whatever, and refugees, of course, have the right uh, to return. Now, at the same time, you give equal rights to everyone, we also recognize, and I'm part of what's called a Palestinian-led one democratic state campaign, and we have a 10-point political program, uh, uh, and that is that um, uh, we recognize that this isn't Kansas. <laughs> this isn't just a place with a bunch of citizens. Citizenship is important, but there are two national groups. Now here we have a tremendous. Here we really have to work things out because Palestinians do not recognize Israelis as a national group. From their point of view, that legitimizes colonialism. If we recognize, it. so they they don't want to do that, and instead they want to give Israeli Jews equal rights, but as a minority, a religious ethnic minority. That's not going to work for Israelis, obviously, because over the last 75 years of independence, of sovereignty in a state, they have become, like it or not, they have become a national group. 
Now, at the same time, Israelis don't recognize Palestinians as a national group, as we've talked about. So this is something we have to work on. But basically, we're living in a, in a, in a binational reality. And so the question is, and this is, it, it, it's much more than we can talk about in the next 30 seconds. The trick is we have to invent a new state with a new name. Maybe you call it Zatar. And we'll all be Zatarians or something. In other words, there has to be a neutral civil state in which we're all citizens. We're all citizens of the same state. And there's a new civil society that emerges. And, and, you know, when we when our football teams get into the World Cup, our team, the Zatarian football team, it's our team. In other words, there'll be a new hour. We have to create a civil hour, a, a, a collective that doesn't exist today. And then within that civil state that exists, with its government and its parliament and its laws and its institutions and its football team, national football team and so on, Within that, you have to give space, meaningful space, to the two national groups. In other words, there'll be museums. You know, Israelis won't stop speaking Hebrew. You're not going to close uh, the Hebrew University. There'll still be a Hebrew TV channels, Hebrew literature, Hebrew theater. And the same with the Palestinians. You know, there'll be an Arabic culture and a very, and Palestinian culture will, will flourish in a national cultural way. But what we have to prevent, and this is the danger of nationalism, you know, the whole essence of nationalism is every national group wants hegemony. It wants to rule. And so these two national groups are going to be against each other, and they're going to be against the civil state that exists, because Palestinians will want this to be a Palestinian state, Israeli Jews will want it to be a, a Jewish state. You always have that. and so. And so what we're going to have to do over time is what South Africa did, really, strengthen uh, the, uh, the, the civil state, strengthen the citizenship, strengthen the idea that we're all living together, we're working together, strengthen the civil identity, especially among young people, and, and contain this destructive impulse of nationalism to break it all apart and dominate. So that's going to be the, the, the tension a civil state that gives space to national groups, but doesn't allow them the, only within the framework of, a, of the civil society. Now, there isn't the Jewish state. That's true. You cannot have in the 21st century an ethically pure state, especially in a country where the Jews are the minority today. You can't have that unless you have apartheid. And I don't think you can justify apartheid, you know, because apartheid is not anti-Semitic. It, it gets crazy. So what we have to say is there will be Jewish self-determination, if you want to say, uh, Jewish expression, national cultural expression within the framework of a common state that belongs to all of us. And that's going to be hard to do, and it's going to be a whole process, but it's the, I think it's the only way out. And it's, so it's not anti-Semitic. On the contrary, Israel, you don't have to dismantle settlements. Israelis can live in, in the land of Israel. You could be religious. You can go live in Hebron if you want to. The whole country. You know, in other words, and you're free from this idea of us and them, and we're invading and we have to have exclusive settlement. No, we're all living together, but we're living in a shared country, basically. And that's, I think, the vision that, that we have to try to, uh, I think it's the only vision that's realistic. Hard, yeah. but ruthless. and the only thing that really is going to resolve this in a way that's just and that really works. Period. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, no, as usual, um, it's everything you've said is very interesting and it's um, enlightening as well, and uh, it's realistic. Uh, what a lot of the things that the media and Biden are, are talking about, we know is complete um, bullshit, you know, but, you know, to, to, to actually, as you mentioned, the no solution, you know, this That's continuous right. status quo that... Can um, I say one more word? One yeah, of course. That, just on that, that's the danger. And that's why we're now beginning to mount a campaign called 
the campaign against two-state apartheid. Mm. Because Biden is now going to start pushing a two-state idea. But the two-state idea has to be apartheid because Biden and, the, and, and Europe are not going to force Israel to give up its settlements. You know, uh, uh, so that we're going to really see the emergence of a Palestinian Bantustan, kind of a, a two-state solution will be Israel trans sky. <laughs> You'll have a Palestinian trans sky. You know, young people don't remember that or a Bantustan, but these were the little enclaves, non-sovereign in South Africa within the wider South African apartheid regime. You'll have little Palestinian enclaves that, you know, Biden could call them a state. Who cares? You know, we'll call it a state, but there'll be little enclaves, non-viable, non-sovereign, non-connected, uh, all divided by settlements within a wider Israeli apartheid regime. So we, that's the two-state idea that Biden is going to be pushing. So if two, if he wants to talk about two states, I'd rather not talk about two states because it's good. But if that's on the agenda, then our campaign and we're going to publicize it soon, lists what exact what elements have to be in place if you really want a, a, a genuine Palestinian state that's sovereign and viable in all the occupied territory, including East Jerusalem. And we have to be the watchdogs. We have to be the monitors that they don't pull you know, over our eyes a, a two-state apartheid in the guise of a two-state solution, and and that's that's the immediate because this is going to happen in the next couple of months, and and this is the the big danger to the Palestinians, no less than the genocide going on in Gaza. Last thanks, Jeff. My... No, but thanks. It's uh, it's very important, and, it, and you're right. It's very important to push back and to be on the offensive. You know, to be prepared and ready because okay. we know what's happening. You know, we so we know what's going to happen. Reactive. We're too yeah. reactive. We're mm. not proactive enough. And for that, we also need more Palestinian leadership, mm. I have to say. Okay. Thanks for hey. having me. Thanks. Thanks again, Jeff. Okay.